Hi, everybody. Welcome to Community Conversations uh, for our second session on this quarter's uh, series on a sense of place. Please join us again next week, again at 11.30 a.m. Uh, next week, we're gonna have Mark Gaither present Two Worlds, Three Realities, Teaching from the Other Side of the Planet. And this week, I'm very pleased to have a new speaker join, somebody from off campus, but somebody that I met a very, very long time ago. Uh, don't even know if you remember when we had our little chat, like in 2011. <laughs> well, I started working, I think that's when I was doing the, uh, um, the school beat. Yes, yes. Uh, this is Leslie Slape. Leslie Slape spent more than three decades in journalism and professional storytelling and has been involved in theater since her teens as an actor, stage manager, and director. A few years ago, she began writing plays. Her first play was a collaboration with Don Carell, the legendary drama instructor here at, L at Lower Columbia College, and it whet her ap appetite to create a play of her own. Please welcome Leslie Slape. Thank you. And thank you guys for coming today. And thank you for those who are watching online. Uh, this is new for me. So The Harder Courage is a historical tragedy. And so I have a lot of fact in it, but I also have a lot of imagination. And I'm going to differentiate between the two when I'm talking about it today. And I call this the wrong place at the wrong time because I, that's my theory of just why things went south for Robert Day. So this play took place in Kalama, Washington, when Kalama was the county seat. And the, uh, the characters are Benjamin Holmes. I got a photo, whoops, got a photo of Ben. Benjamin Holmes, this is the only picture of Ben. He was kind of camera shy. He was shy period. He was, was kind, gentle, probably the nicest guy in town, just loved children. He didn't talk a lot. I did not find him in the newspapers much because I really don't think he gave any interviews. Um, and yet he was the sheriff of the county. I think, and I'm, I'm basing this just on my, 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 my gut feeling after reading about the kind of person he was. I think that he saw being sheriff as an opportunity to serve, to, to just do, things for others. And so by the, by the time he came in, it was a, a pretty small county and, and not a lot of crime. And so he could be just the man in charge and people would come to him for help. He did a lot of traveling. The sheriff's office made its, um, all of its money through property taxes. And he was the one who went around, he or a deputy would go around and collect those taxes and use that to, to run the office. So he put a lot of miles on his horse. I've seen the mileage report that cracks me up because I think of mileage, you know, is with gas, but he put mileage on his horse and, and was paid for that. And he was um, four years, or excuse me, four terms in office and the terms were two years long each. He was in his fourth term in 1891 when this happened. So he, he I should say, he moved out here in the 1870s uh, with his wife and kids and then had more kids after getting here because he heard about this wonderful place, Cowlitz County from, uh, Mar from his wife's sister, Mary. She and her husband were settled down in um, Oak Point area. And so they came out and and got some um, a timber claim on the Cowiemen, and then Ben bought some property on the Kalama River, an absolutely gorgeous piece of property that was right about three miles up the Kalama, just before it meets the Columbia. And there were natural pools there, and he would sit there, and according to his family, he would just watch. He'd watch the fish would come up the Columbia River when they were spawn, um, you know, going upstream to spawn, and they'd go up the Kalama. And then they'd come to those pools and they'd just kind of sink down and just like, like they're just resting for a little bit, you know? And he's watching, they're so thick, you know, you could, back in those days, the fish were so thick, it like people, many people said it was like, you could walk right across the river on their backs. 
And then they'd go upstream and the Kalama was not a, a very navigable river. You, a lot of white water. Uh, so, so with Ben, it was almost a, well, you had to do everything on horseback there. You couldn't, you couldn't take a, a steamboat. Like uh, they had a lot of steamboats. This was the era of the steamboat and the Columbia River was just full of them. And they had steamboats going up the Lewis River, which is a major part of the play, but not up the Kalama, just, just there on horse. So he built a house there. And today that spot is occupied by the Fallert Creek Fish Hatchery, the first hatchery in the state of Washington. So uh, Ben and his wife and, and kids, they lived there and had a, a one, the stories of their life is pretty idyllic. A lot of music, a lot of, a lot of family time. But Ben was a sheriff and so he operated out of, and I have a picture of this too, the courthouse, which uh, was an old hotel. Now, um, Kalama became the county seat when they kind of stole it away from the point of view of the people in Freeport. They stole it away from the little town of Freeport, which doesn't exist anymore. There's a little tiny piece of it at the end of, um, of Hudson Street, right along the Cowlitz. Um, but it was there and flooding all the time and people, you know, they still got mad that Kalama took, voted the county seat away, but they, they said, we've got a courthouse. And it was up on a hill, so you couldn't get flooded. And so Ben's, office was right here on the corner and over here was the jail and over here's the courtroom. Now the facts are that on October 9th 1891 Robert Day went hunting, came home and found out from his wife and and little boy that there um that Robert's son, Dexter, had gotten hurt. Now, Robert lived along the Lewis River on the North Fork of the Lewis, right about where Lake Merwin is today. And he had moved into a logging shanty that had been abandoned and had been living there since 1888. They'd improved the shanty. He believed that he could establish squatters rights. This is kind of you know debatable whether he could or couldn't, but he believed it and it, he treated it like, like it was homesteading. You get on the land, you live on it, you improve it, and then you own it. He believed if he lived on it and improved it, then when it was surveyed, because right at this point it was still public land, it was surveyed, then he could buy it. And he was desperate when he moved. I mean, he tried to find land to buy. He tried to find a job. He'd been in there about four months and ran out of money. He had $1 left when he heard he could, you know, maybe move into that logging shanty. And so he took that and that opportunity. And in 1880, 1889 or 90, 1890, there was um, logging outfits that moved up there on the Lewis River. One of them was on one side of him and the other one was on the other side of him. The one downstream of him was operated by the BBs and the one uh, upstream was the Mercs. So in between these two logging camps, Robert Day thought, oh, I'll earn a little money logging. But that day, that particular day he was hunting, but his son was earning money logging and he was 16 years old. Come, Robert comes home and he hears he's been hurt. The first thought when you hear someone who's been logging and has gotten hurt is it that it's a logging accident, that maybe maybe a limb fell on him, maybe worse, maybe he cut himself with an ax. So of course, Robert's very upset and his wife's trying to calm him down, but the little boy said that he'd been, he'd been knocked down by the straw boss, by his, by his boss. And so, well, Robert wants to find out what happened. He goes down to the camp. Now, what he did was take his gun with him. And in those days, most towns had a no gun policy. Most places had a no gun policy. Um, you didn't take a gun into a logging camp. You took it hunting, but you didn't take it to the logging camp. You didn't take it into town. The sheriff did not carry a gun. Ben Holmes didn't didn't believe in it, apparently. And 
And it, apparently this was very common, not carrying guns uh, amongst the sheriffs. And so Robert Day walks into the logging camp with a rifle. That caused quite the sensation. Then he wants to know, he wants to talk to the guy who hit his son. And the guy was just leaving. So Robert follows him. Now there was two, there was, there was Clint Beebe and his cousin, David Beebe. The, DB, the Beebe's go and they, and the story is told by David Beebe that Robert Day caught up with them, talked with them for a while, and then suddenly pulled up his gun and shot Clint. David ran to report the crime and everybody came looking for Robert and he was hiding in the woods, they didn't find him. And then the next day he was arrested and brought in to custody and put in the jail. <clears throat> what happened according to Robert was a bit different. He said he had just gone to talk. They had been very angry. They had tried to take his gun away from him. And because of that, he, there was a struggle over the gun. The gun went off. Robert said, I was defending myself that these guys had threatened to hurt me. They had hurt my son already. They threatened to hurt me. They threatened to hurt my family. And I was just defending myself. It was, I was in the right. And I certainly didn't go there with the intent of committing murder. But the trial uh, took place in December and it was very quick. Uh, the testimony was strong against Robert Day and he was convicted, he was sentenced to hang. In these days, the sheriff was responsible for performing the hanging. Ben Holmes, the nicest guy in town with a kind heart for children, would have to kill a man and certainly he did not want to do that. But he also was not the kind of guy who was going to order somebody else to do that. He had, he had deputies, they weren't full time, but he hired them, you know, as needed. He could have maybe had a deputy do that job, but he did not want to. Robert, uh, understandably, was going to appeal the case. He didn't have enough money, so the execution was set for February. Then the uh, state Supreme Court declared him indigent, and they decided to hold the, well, they canceled the, they canceled the hanging and the, the hearing on his appeal was held in April. The Supreme Court came back with its decision in May that uh, they denied the appeal. Robert wrote to the governor asking for clemency saying, please, would you at least sentence me to life so that I, I don't wanna die. And they said, we are sorry, but the state has only one punishment for first degree murder and that is execution by hanging. And on June 3rd, Ben Holmes hanged Robert. Those are the facts. The rest of what I put in on the stage was either uh, my imagination or what could have happened, what, what could possibly have happened, but I didn't have hard evidence that it did happen. And part of it in my imagination was just why was Robert found guilty? Because you see, he could very well have been telling the truth and, and been protecting himself. And one mystery was that the, the victim was shot through the side. He was shot in the right side, the bullet went through both lungs and exited. And I can't see how he could have gotten shot in the side if he was just standing there talking, as the, uh, as the witness said. They were, we were just standing you know, some, some ways apart from him, just talking, and he drew up his gun and he shot, they said, or Davy said. Well, then he wouldn't have been shot in the side. So Darren Ullman and I had worked out a possible a uh, scenario and Darren was a sheriff's deputy who brought me the story in the first place when I was a crime reporter. And it, it could have been as they were struggling and they pulled the gun away that when Robert pulled back, the gun 
was positioned in such a way as to shoot him right through the side. I've got, th I put that on the stage. I have no idea if Ben worked that out, but it made, it made sense. And if that was the case, why didn't the attorney, why didn't his defense attorney, um, I, his defense attorney, I don't think did a very good job. And uh, this is my theory of what happened with that. The defense attorney was a man who himself had been convicted of murder um, when he was in Iowa. And I don't think that people out here knew that. He, um, he was a lawyer. He shared his office with another lawyer and they fell out, you know, and there, there was a lot of, of tension between them. And uh, the uh, Myron Billings was the attorney who, who, uh, who was trying to get, I don't get kind of extort money uh, from his former law partner and the, the partner refused. And he said, well, we'll tell, we'll talk about you. I'll, I'll tell people that you tried to, to, um, to seduce my wife. And there was shouting and the, there was a witness in the building who heard shouting. And then there were two gunshots. Um, Myron Billings runs out into the street. I've been shot, I've been shot, he says. And they find a little hole in the back of his coat and a little dent in his back. And right there between the hole and the, and the, and the little bruise is his suspender. Uh, grip and that has apparently stopped the bullet. Um, nobody believed that. It sounded like it was cooked up. And so he was accused of, uh, of killing his, part, his law partner and faking his own um, attempt at murder. Uh, and the jury convicted him, uh, but there was a mistake in in the documents and somehow in, in the legal documents. And so Myron Billings, being a lawyer, had, had spotted that little thing and he said, uh, you can't convict, this is, this is all wrong. And he got, a, that was mistrial, he got a new trial. He was again convicted of murder, but the judge in giving the sentence said, you know, I wouldn't have found you guilty, sir. And because of that, it got thrown out again. And this time he left town very quickly because he saw a, an opening for a law practice in Kalama, Washington. So he's out here and he's making a, a really good business by spotting loopholes in all these documents and getting cases thrown out. Judges had gotten sick and tired of this practice about the time Robert Day was uh, on trial. And when Myron Billings tried that tactic with Robert's case, the judge threw it out and then the Supreme Court also threw it out. He tried the same thing with both cases and neither one of them worked. Apparently in the charging documents, it omitted the word a human being, that Robert Day had killed Thomas Clinton Beebe comma, a human being is apparently old style law. He said, well, it doesn't say he's a human being. So um, we have to do the trial again. And the judge says, come on now. <laughs> and and um, so that's one theory that, that on my part is that his attorney tried a tactic that judges were sick and tired of and weren't gonna let him get away with it. Another thing that happened right about the same time was there was an increase in lynchings. Uh, one of the facts that happened, which I hadn't mentioned in my summation of the facts was that right after Robert Day was arrested, a lynch mob came for him. Lynch mobs were pretty common in the old West, the, the wild portion of it, which was been tamed by this time but somehow the lynch mobs came back. You know, with a sheriff in charge, you wouldn't need to take the law into your own hands, but it was coming back. And some of it seemed to be a reaction to, I think the, the public felt that 
criminals were getting away with stuff. And part of it was that they were getting their cases overturned on these technicalities. And they were impatient with the law and they wanted to take it into their own hands. Well, the sheriffs, and Ben was a member of the Sheriff's Association. He was a treasurer of the, the Washington State Sheriff's Association. They were trying to think of how can we stop this? How can we get these lynch mobs to stop killing people? Because there had been three lynchings already in 1891. And there hadn't been one in Washington for nine years before that. So, well, they decided we were just going to have to be firmer about, about enforcing our laws against, uh, against murder. Because if, we, if the people can know that we will punish this person, then they won't try to do it themselves. This, um, there's a book called Rough Justice that explores that, but he feels that lynching was merely replaced by a revitalized death penalty in Washington. And indeed, if they had let Robert go free, if he had won his case and been allowed to go free, there is every chance that a lynch mob would have come after him and seen justice done in their, in their opinion. And then another thing I think was a factor, and this again is just um, supposition on my part, is it's possible people thought that Robert Day might not, how do I put this? Um, I'm going to pull up a picture of his brother. People have asked me this several times in, um, in talking about lynching is, was Robert Day black? Chances are that he might have been, uh, this is not Robert, this is his brother. Uh, this, he might have been of mixed heritage, but I don't know that. The thing is, I think people might have thought he was. All the censuses say he's white. Um, none of the newspapers mention color. They always would if, if he was. But people might in their imagination think he had black hair, just like his brother, black hair, brown eyes, and According to the um, according to the log uh, in the jail roster, he had a dark complexion, which my dad was the same coloring. So, and my dad um, was Ukrainian and Jewish. So, you know, there's no way that I know that Robert. I I think he might have been part Native American, but I don't know that. His uncle married uh, a native woman, his son married a Clatsop woman, um, and his other son was even reported when he went missing in 1910, was reported in the newspapers as being what they called him a quarter breed. They assumed that he was native because um, he'd been in uh, the Salem Indian School. And the family said, no, no, we just said that so we can get him in the school. Um, I just think that even though in the Pacific Northwest, lynch mobs didn't act necessarily in a racial manner, I think that it, when it did happen and they would lynch someone who was not white, most people who were lynched were white, um, but when they lynched somebody who was not white, uh, they would wave it aside as that's no big deal. The first person who was lynched in 1891 in Washington was an Okanagan boy, only 15 years old. They lynched him because they thought he was a murderer. He was a material witness. And when people heard that he wasn't even guilty, they never even, not even a suspect. They said, oh, well, he was only an Indian. So this may have been an unsaid reason behind the hatred of Robert Day. And then the final thing is he was a Confederate soldier, a former Confederate soldier, and it was only a generation since the Civil War. And there was a new, um, newly formed group in Callis County, the Grand Army of the Republic, 
which was a bunch of former Union soldiers. It was a, a national organization. It was it had a wielded a lot of political clout. Most of the people, if who if they uh, happened to be a member of that organization and ran for office, everybody in the organization would vote for them. Uh, and they would be overwhelmingly Republican because Lincoln. So obviously Robert Day was on the other side and the Beebe family who were the owners of that logging outfit and whose son Clint Beebe had been killed, they were Union soldiers. Also the Beebe's owned a sawmill. They employed a lot of people in the mill and even more people in the woods. And Robert Day, even though he was logging, probably didn't know much about that. He, I mean, he was in his 40s. He was in his early 40s when he started working for them and he had been a rancher. And it, it stands to reason that perhaps he was not knowing how to do the work and people would be saying, oh, you did that wrong. You did that wrong. You did that wrong. And there might've been just issues. An issue that I do know happened was that Robert had cattle. They wandered around in the woods. They didn't have fences on the North Fork of the Lewis River in those days. And so the cattle would just wear bells and they're wandering around through the woods and probably getting in the way of the logging operations. And they, on the day that Clint, uh, B.B. slapped Robert Day's son and knocked him to the ground. There was a little dispute over Robert Day's cattle eating the hay that had been put out by the B.B.s for the oxen that were doing the logging work. So I feel like I'm wandering. I tell, I tell, I've told this story so many times. It's like I know it by heart. So, I'm, but I don't tell it in the same way every time. Anyway, we have um, the play speculates that in the eight months between Robert Day's arrest and his execution, Robert and Ben became friends. I base this on a couple of things. One is that sheriff's deputies have told me it's pretty easy actually to talk to prisoners. You find you have a lot in common you can get to know each other pretty well and you can even like them. You don't necessarily become bosom buddies because there's always a little bit of a, of a holding back because you're officially arresting them after all. But in Ben's case, he's in this office. He's the only full-time employee. The jail is right off the sheriff's office and they were together for eight months. You get to know each other really well. Sometimes Robert be the only prisoner. And there was a brand new jail cell that he was put in back um, in, in February, they ordered it. And when it arrived, uh, I've been in it. It's scary. It is eight by five. There's room for the bed. It was like a slat, uh, slats that were, you know, I guess they threw a mattress or something on it. And that's about it, just a bed and maybe a little chair or desk or something for him, because he wrote a lot of letters. He must have, and it was designed to use on railroad cars when you're transporting prisoners by rail. There was a mesh ceiling at the top, but there was no bars. It was just a solid door with a, with a food slot in it. And when I walked inside of it, because it was owned, still owned by this family in Woodland. It's like, how can you even see? It was cold. It was made of, of, of cast iron. It was dark because there was only that slot and then, then the mesh ceiling above. And if you're inside, as he was, there's not even any way for light to come down in. And they couldn't have like given him candles or, or oil lamps and they didn't have electricity. It existed, but not in Kalama. Um, so, so it must have been terribly dark and scary. And to a, a person like Robert Day, 
who suffered some pretty big horrors in, in the Civil War. He had been there in, in it when he was 15 years old and he served up until the end. It, it had to be like being in a tomb. Plus he was terrified of being hanged. So I think that Ben left the door open. I mean, the only way, only place that Robert could go when he came out of the jail was into Ben's office. So he would have left the door open uh, and they could talk, you know, or had a, or he even just let him come out and, and let, let him talk. And he couldn't walk outside. That was against the rules. But he, according to a news story, he had treated him in a kind and considerate way and denied him nothing in keeping with the circumstances. So I think that that showed a real act of friendship. Not only that, when he hanged Robert, it's traditional to, to bind someone by the hands and, and by the feet. And he didn't do that for Robert. Robert was allowed to walk up the gallows unshackled. And then he let him talk as long as he wanted. And I have his speech. And he talked to the people out there in, in a way that was described as, as calm and, and like a parson giving a sermon, they said, and not a condemned man begging for mercy. And he, he again said he'd been defending himself and he did not he did not feel that he had committed murder, but he was willing to take his punishment because he had taken a life. I think that people believed what we today call conspiracy theories about Robert Day. And I read in many of the newspapers, he was reported as being uh, a desperado, had killed like as many as 30 men just to see them fall, how he committed murders in Virginia. And, and, and he seemed like he, he was a, like a wild gunman. And he denied all of that. And I could not find any, any evidence to say that he actually did any of the things that they swore he did. But when they heard him on the gallows and he had just become a Christian, he just, he just, um, uh, been baptized as a Catholic, they, they knew that he couldn't lie or he would go to hell. And, and uh, so he's up there telling them that he's an innocent man, uh, just been defending his family. They believed that and they had a wholly different opinion of Robert Day after that and the stories about him in the newspaper after his hanging were like how he died like a man, how he was noble, how he was showed courage. And I think people really felt differently about him and in hanging in general, at least for a while. And as far as getting back to the, the sense of even in the wrong place at the wrong time is I feel if Robert Day had come earlier, none of this would have happened. He would have established himself in the traditional way of homesteading or something. And, and he would have this just been known as the, the storyteller and, and the good old boy that he was. But in 1891 and 92 with lynching exploding all over the United States and with the the pressure to try to, to not let people get off on technicalities and little, little tweaks that Robert Day just didn't have any luck. He was being made an example of and, and um, it's all in great hopes that nothing like that would happen again in Cowes County. Unfortunately, it did. <laughs> and there were two more hangings, but that's another story. I be glad to answer any questions. Yes, sir. We're going to use the microphone so it picks up on the recording. Hello, my name's Sean. Uh, so 
based off of uh, both of all the information, why wasn't it the uh, why wasn't it reinvestigated with modern forensics today? Modern forensics today. Uh, why didn't they reinvestigate it with modern forensics? Or yes, why, why can it not be reinvestigated with modern forensics? Well, for one thing, you would need to have all the evidence. You would need to have saved the evidence. And I don't think they saved evidence from that far back. I know that I've looked for the court documents and they are not, they do not exist anymore. Well, it's almost like, uh, oh, what was it? Richard the second that was found underneath the, uh, Richard the third. Well, see, they had the reinvestigate and a lot of that was gone, the, the actual hard evidence. So they had to recreate. And that's what I'm saying. They do have a body still of, unless he was cremated. Oh, you mean Clint? Yes. Um, and then I don't know where he's go, buried, but. Um, and then they can just not rewind, but take it step by step backwards and then come up with a complete story. Interesting. No, I, I don't know. And, and that's a good question uh, because I've been working with the sheriff's office on this play and, and never once have they said, you know what, we should reinvestigate. I think probably the expense and the family has to want that. Yeah, there, there has to be agreement that people want to exhume. Um, yeah. So for example, in the case of Warren G. Harding, for instance, there was claims about a, um, illegitimate children and they wanted to exhume the body of Warren G. Harding in order to find that out. And they have to get family permission in order to do that. And a lot of times the family doesn't want to dig up the body anymore. They want, they want this to be done. Yeah. Okay, question. Hi, my name's Neil. Um, I think I missed something. How many people did they say he killed? Oh, there were, there was uh, one story that he shot 30 men just to see them fall. There was another story that he'd murdered two or three men after the war. The 30 was during the war, two or three after the war. Um, he said the Clint Beebe is the only man he has ever killed in his life. Well, who made up these stories? Good question. I could not find the source. Um, so I would find newspapers would say, it is said that, you know, but they would not credit. It is reported. Yeah, yes, many people are saying, you know, but yeah, I think that in those days, sometimes the journalists just got lazy. It's interesting talking about not digging your body up. I just uh, read this about Lewis and Clark, how they thought Lewis was murdered instead of committing suicide, but the family doesn't want to dig the body up. Wow. So that's still, you know. How many years ago was that? And he's still talking about that. Was he murdered or was it suicide? Because how many people commit suicide and shoot themselves twice? Yeah. No. <laughs> Depends on how poorly the first shot goes. Um, so yes. I have, yeah. Oh, good, good, good. Hi, Michael. Um, Hi. So I'm assuming this guy was not allowed to switch attorneys if the one attorney um, was not. Myron Billings, as far as I could tell, was the only defense attorney in town. I think he should have been able to go to a different venue, a different county, and get a, you know, a, a trial elsewhere. But yeah, I looked, Myron Billings was it, pretty much. Okay, then that explains it, because it seems like he could have had, he should have had the right to do that. If, if yeah. It wasn't. Okay. That's um, I have sort of a theoretical question on this, which would be, where is the line between historical fiction and history? Or where do you see that line? Well, I know that as a reporter, I felt, I felt like I was committing a sin every time I stepped into speculation. I had to give myself permission to not be the reporter and actually create some things. Um, but I'm not sure where the, I mean, I kind of feel that everything that I put in that I didn't know for a fact was true was speculative fiction um, and sometimes deliberate. Like in the play, I have been arresting Robert. In real life, another person, uh, a constable from Woodland made the arrest. It's just simpler for me to have you know, fewer actors on the stage. 
that's clearly drawing, uh, that's clearly crossing a line into absolute fiction, um, but there's justification for it when you're doing it in a play. I, yeah, I think, I think anytime you make it up, that's the line, even if it could have happened, if you don't know for sure that it did, because that I would not put in, in a news story um, if I didn't know for sure that it happened. Yeah, that's a very good point. And also, you know, when you don't have the evidence for something, it, it could be the most logical answer, but we don't have proof. Right. So we can't make those claims. Yeah. All right. I, I did a lot of reading between the lines. <laughs> My major source was newspapers. And I was grateful for that because of not having the, uh, the court documents. But I, as a reporter, also could tell when a reporter was kind of making it up or, or making a guess but getting wrong. Um, if I had better information than that reporter did, I, it was pretty easy to spot those. But, um, and then of course, just there was a bias against him, especially in the Kalama newspaper. So you, yeah, you just got to consider the source. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thanks to our audience for joining us. And please come back again next week. Okay.